Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Fight Focus. And for today's video, we will be covering fighters that taunted their opponents then got knocked out. Also, if you enjoy this video, please make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and comment what video you want to see next. Let's get to it. In modern combat sports, there's an almost necessary aspect that has been handed down through the ages, and that's the tradition of hyping fights. In the pursuit of selling tickets and pay-per-views, or sometimes just because that's the way they are, fighters often go all out with trash talking and try to antagonize their opponents. Some of the greatest trash talkers of all time have been amazing fighters, Muhammad Ali was a prime example as a guy that could talk the talk and walk the walk all the same. The subject of today's video is fighters that fail miserably in the latter. Of course, there's a huge difference between verbally slating your opponent and being outright cocky. When turning heel in a mixed martial arts rivalry, it's key that you are able to live up to your own hype or you'll become a cautionary tale. When all is said and done, an athlete's performance on fight night is what will stick in everybody's mind. If you've acted like a tool before or perhaps even during that event, you might end up being the subject of an undesirable video such as this one. So without further ado, this is fighters that taunted their opponents then got knocked out. Number 12, Dominic Reyes vs Jordan Powell. Ever since his pro MMA debut, Dominic Reyes has rightfully earned his nickname as the Devastator. He has been making a quick work of his opponents with his elite level striking and brutal power. Before fighting Jan and John Jones, Reyes held a perfect record of 12 wins with no losses with 7 of them coming via KO slash TKO. He also had 2 submission wins on his resume. Dominic Reyes caught Powell with a head kick right after Powell was trying to signify that he was not hurt by Reyes' shots. Oh, man. Oh, the big kibosh! The big kibosh! The big kibosh! The speed and accuracy at which Reyes landed the kick were right on point. There was no doubt left that the fight was over. Number 11, Kelsey Gilmore vs Joanna Wood. Though this fight was not a knockout, it was just too satisfying to let go. Both ladies faced off at Revolution Fight Series 20 Rise of Warriors back in 2018. Before the fight had started, Joanna had decided to go face to face with Kelsey talking a lot of smack trying to get in her head. Little did she know that all that trash talking would go down the drain when she would get TKO'd in the third round. Referee Brian Hiles steps in and that is that! Number 10, Levan Makashvili. At AC8109 in Poland of August 2020, fighters Roman Dijk and Levan Makashvili were under 30 seconds away from closing out round 2. As the clock wound down though, Deke appeared to want to keep the action going, challenging his opponent by throwing his arms up to the side. It's like that Levin is almost taking the last minute off, trying to get some extra breathing. Roman calling it. Oh! Oh! As we say that, Levin Makashvili with the two hooks connecting. Well, Makashvili sure brought the action, and as the two fighters clashed once more, Makashvili landed a right and then left hook that knocked his opponent to sleep, ending the fight in just seconds. Number 9, Bech Kohea. Bech Kohea paid the price for asking Holly Holm to come at her. Holly Holm knocked out Kohea at UFC Fight Night Singapore with a dramatically vicious kick to the head and subsequent blows. The fateful sequence came moments after Kohea taunted Holm in the third round of their women's bantamweight bout. Martial arts, she's employing a lot of the same techniques that she did in boxing. Yes. Oh! 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 In the manner in which Holm prevailed will prevent her from ever forgetting UFC Fight Night Singapore. Number 8, Jason Solomon. MMA fighter Jason Solomon put a lot of time and effort into pulling off one of the cockiest walk-on routines ever that week. Once inside, he swung on the entrance, confidently walked around and got in the face of his opponent, Amites Chabi, all designed for full-on intimidation. But guess what happened just 9 seconds into the fight? The gladiators in the red, and here we go! For the welterweight. Oh! He's hurt! He's hurt! He's hurt! He's hurt! He's out! On! Number 7, Joe Harding. Whilst a little showboating in a fight could be okay, you probably shouldn't stop to dance in the middle of your fight. That's exactly what Joe Harding did at BC MMA 16 when he faced Johan Segas with Segas knocking his opponent out in ridiculous circumstances. To follow it up again with the jab. Oh! And this always sinks! These are the two fellows after the fight. Number 6, Anderson Silva. Former UFC middleweight champion Anderson Silva squared off against Chris Weidman at UFC 162 as the heavy favorite and started clowning his underdog opponent from the moment the octagon door was closed. Anderson Silva started mimicking that he got knocked out as soon as he got knocked out. Anderson. Oh my 
Oh, he got hit! Look at the damn shit! Hit it, it's all over! Number 5. James Gallagher Ricky Bandejas briefly silenced the talkative James Gallagher on that Friday when he emerged victorious from the Bellator 204 main event. Gallagher used the months leading into Bellator 204 to make some bold statements about beating Bandejas. Even in the cage prior to the start of the fight, Gallagher got in Bandejas' face for several seconds without security intervention. Number 4. Terry Martin in one of the signature wars of his professional career, Lieben fought Martin tooth and nail for two and a half rounds of action. Lieben gave as good as he got in most of the exchanges, but it was clear that Martin held an edge in both knockout power and boxing skill. While it would seem strange to Chris Lieben, the better conditioned athlete, he certainly had more left in the tank than Martin when they reached the final round. Late in the fight, Martin ahead on the scorecards made the dire mistake of trying to finish Lieben with strikes. Lieben had only been finished with strikes once in his professional career, and that was by Anderson Silva. Number 3. Saba Homasi In a rematch from their first meeting at UFC 217, a welterweight matchup between Saba Homasi and Abdul Razak al Hassan took place as part of the FS1 preliminary card. Saba Homasi was doing a little dance as he was being introduced, but al Hassan didn't look like he was in the mood to have fun. Take one more look. Al Hassan just perfectly times that. Number two, Alexander Emelianenko over Sergei Khartonov. The two men met at Pride FC, final conflict absolute back in September of 2006. Alexander surprised the crowd by circling and bouncing like a trained boxer, rather than charging straight at Khartonov as most had expected him to do. Alex looked gassed and Khartonov got cocky, waiting for Alex to try and hit him on the chin. Emelianenko obliged, catching Sergei, then laying in some fierce ground and pound. Number 1. Shy Lindsay vs Carlo Junio The first mistake fighters do when they get confident is try to mimic Nick Diaz. Since his knockout happened at the very end of round 2, an inept referee might have woken up Lindsay and given him a chance to get his revenge in round 3. He's landed some big shots. Lindsay's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a little Nick Diaz there. Oh! oh big kick. That is the end, ladies and gentlemen. And that right there concludes this list. Let us know how we did in the comments below. All right, MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, make sure to hit the notification bell, and don't forget to subscribe if you're new. Also, don't forget to comment below what video you want to see next. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Fight Focus. And for today's video, we will be covering MMA fighters that showboated and got knocked out. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and comment what video you want to see next. Let's get to it. We all know, a lot of fights can sometimes be boring despite the hype that came with it. We all love to see fighters showing respect to one another during the buildup of a fight or even sometimes during it, but that doesn't always get the audience excited. Sometimes fighters like to spice up the fight by taunting their opponents in hopes that they get the bonus by knocking them out. But it can be kind of embarrassing when you try to taunt but then end up waking up a few minutes later. For this video, we've compiled a list of instances where MMA fighters taunted and showboated their opponents but ended up getting knocked out or losing their fight. Number 12, Julian Wallace. Okay, we all love this one. Julian Wallace was filmed with the championship belt draped across his shoulder as he pushed and shoved MMA fighter Ben Nguyen ahead of their highly anticipated fight. Footage would then show the fight the next day, which saw Wallace slumped in the corner after just 20 seconds following a rain of punches from Nguyen. To add more to it, here's him getting knocked out in training. But looking tough and taunting didn't really help him in this fight. Number 11 Drunk Uncle a cocky MMA fighter, or whatever you want to call him, was knocked out cold by his opponent after goading him and showboating in the ring.
Just because Nick Diaz does it, doesn't mean everybody else should. Appearing confident, the fighter opened his arms out and invited the other man to hit him hard in the face, and it just took a few seconds before his opponent accepted the challenge and punched him square on the jaw. Number 10, Dillashaw Zaribov. A cocky fighter's plan to go to his opponent backfired when he got knocked out with the very next punch. Hey, come on. Yeah. There's a left hand. There's another left hand. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, that's it, ladies and that's gentlemen. Be it. Zarapov was getting caught and decided to drop his hands and taunt Kurotolo. Kurotolo needed no second invitation to throw more heavy leather at Zarapov. He threw a lead shot that was more akin to a distance measuring feint, but before following it up with an incredible hammer of a right hand. That follow up blow was so powerful it left Zarapov flat on his back in a vulnerable position and that was all it took to instigate the referee stoppage. Number 9 Eric Silva Afterwards, even Eric himself admitted this was a pretty bad idea. As well, right back up, Silva trying to engage. Oh, oh look at that. Wow. Touch of gloves. Kind of. And he faked him out with a left hook to the body. Silva grinned and stuck his arm out for a fist bump. As Talib accepted the gesture, Silva hit him with the left hook. What happened next was the first sign that there may be, in fact, be some justice in the world, especially a little thing we like to hear in the MMA world karma. A few minutes later, Talib grabbed the teep kick by Silva and blasted him in the face with the chopping right hand. Silva turned and face planted like he got shot as Herb Dean rushed in to save him. Number 8, James McSweeney. Big Country definitely showed who was the better fighter after he shut down James's showboating. McSweeney started showboating a little bit, popping his chin out there saying hit me, and Roy did. <laughs> James really wanted to land that right hand all night, but had little to no luck. This would all end when both fighters would break apart and meet in the middle, where Roy would tag James with a straight left. Roy would later get James in the crucifix as Steve Matsugati for once stopped the fight at the right time. Number 7, Michael Page. This is one of the more satisfying defeats ever seen. An opportunity to advance to the final of the $1 million welterweight world. Not quite at 100%. Oh, and there But in the night's defining shot, Lima timed a perfect leg kick on one of Page's patented lunges, sending him completely off balance and right to the eventual path of a beautiful shovel hook, one that put out the highly touted striker's lights. With this loss, Page crashed out of the Bellator Welterweight Grand Prix and suffered the first loss of his pro career to date. Number 6, Jonathan Ivey. No head butting, no groin attack, no back attack. This is going to be a three out of range of those, uh, those right straight hands for Ivey. And lands a big straight hand. The American showman refused to look at his opponent during their face-off in the ring, instead of making funny faces at the camera. He screamed in his face before beginning the fight by performing the praying mantis. The crowd loved it, although not quite as much as they loved watching Ivy get his shit rocked on his backside by a huge right hook from Sato. Number 5, Matt Wyman. On to one of the cooler flying knees ever seen. He's willing to stand up and let Wyman back up. I think he wants to continue oh. to open this up. Good combination, Wyman oh, says oh, Wyman. Wyman. A right hand stunned Wyman, and attempting to show he was okay, the newcomer waved a wagging finger at Fisher, who responded by leaping at him with a flying knee, knocking him senseless. It was one of the best knockouts of 2006, and it turned Fisher into a man to watch at 155 pounds, and stood as one of the UFC's best flying knee KOs over a decade later. Number 4, Rafael Natal. Natal's antics are what made this way sweeter. Natal showing some nice movement now, very nice lateral movement, now Craig is oh, oh, oh. Natal! Natal, who frequently switched stances and varied his attacks to confuse his opponent, but his defense was sorely lacking and Craig took full advantage with another high kick, the shot slammed into Natal's jaw and sent him crashing to the mat. A few overhead punches were academic as referee Marcos Rosales called off the bout at the 4 minute and 52 second mark of the second frame. Number 3, James Thompson. Just cause Hamzat yells before his fights doesn't mean everyone else has to. Thompson is 25. He's on fire, and this is a slugfest. I told you. And Thompson is rocked by a million acres. And rocked big time.
the fight started as James would full on sprint towards Alexander's direction, which would actually drop Alexander. James thought he smelled blood, so he came in to try and get the finish, but Alexander got up to his feet and started trading back and was actually able to drop James and put him away a few seconds later. Number 2 Bruce Martin This one is kind of funny because Martin was pretty much doing the same motions as Sean O'Malley, but without the same results. At the time there to throw a little message into the crowd, put his hands up, they're back on the feet. Oh! Oh my goodness! A flying knee from Jaskovic! This fight is over! With two minutes left in the round, Martin and Conrad would end up on the ground after a takedown attempt. After Martin would make his way up, he would taunt Conrad yet again, but would end up paying the price. This knee was deadly because the second it made impact, it had Martin on his back and had him out for the count. It seems these days, fighters usually get knocked out cold against a guy who has a unique haircut. Number 1 Jorge Masvidal Jorge Masvidal flashed a smile and dropped his hands towards Kamara Usman after the welterweight champion grazed him with the right hand. Seconds later, Masvidal wasn't laughing at all. And of all the superlatives... Oh! After Usman's fist would cause all that baptism water to fly all over the octagon, Masvidal woke up with both fighters giving each other that respect. And that right there concludes this video. If you made it this far, let us know how we did in the comments below. Alright MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, make sure to hit the notification bell, and don't forget to subscribe if you're new. Also, don't forget to comment below what video you want to see next. From making an enemy of a nightmare matchup to simply biting off way more than you can chew, this is what happens when cocky MMA fighters get humble. Confidence is a great thing for a fighter, but for Jake Ellenberger, his decision to openly laugh at Stephen Wonderboy Thompson's karate style before their fight was, well, a pretty abysmal idea. Wonderboy, a masterful striker and an all-around nice guy, still went into this bout looking to prove a point. And so he managed to spinning wheel kick Ellenberger not once, but twice in the first round to score the finish. Yep, that's one hell of a slice of humble pie. And hey, what do you know? We're not done with people underestimating Wonderboy just yet. No, Kevin Holland, an excellent striker in his own right, decided that using his best path to victory, wrestling Wonderboy, was not an option. Instead, he let his ego get the better of him and stood with Thompson for five rounds, eating a huge amount of damage for his troubles. No, seriously, Wonderboy beat the brakes off Kevin Holland, putting a potentially career-altering level of damage on it. TJ Dillashaw just didn't have an answer for Dominic Cruz's trash talk, but his constant need to satisfy his own ego pre-fight made what followed that a bit sweeter. And look, TJ had every right to be confident, but he was sorely mistaken that he was miles better than the great Cruz. And though their fight was close, the Dominator made TJ miss on his shots more than any fighter had before, or any fighter since. A masterful display. Who decides that they should try to insult the hell out of a living legend? And that is how they're going to earn the respect of the fans? Well, Alexander Hernandez already had his work cut out for him when he signed to take on Donald Cerrone. But man, he awakened something fierce in Cowboy when he decided to talk constant trash pre-fight, calling Donald an old man and a geriatric. Unfortunately, Cerrone stepped up to the plate and absolutely schooled him on fight night. TKOing Hernandez with his trademark head kick. What can we really say about Ronda Rousey's antics against Holly Holm that haven't already been said? Well, Ronda belittled Holly at every opportunity, calling her fake and unworthy of the title shot she had earned. Holm, being the pro she is, kept her words to herself and went out there at UFC 193 and shocked the world, head kicking Rousey into oblivion. And the rest, as they say, was history. Beth Correa makes her first and, spoiler alert, not her last appearance on this list with this ridiculously cocky display against Holly Holm. 
See, the thing about Holm is that she's not only a UFC championship level mixed martial artist or an excellent kicker, maybe the best in women's MMA history, but she's also a former boxing world champion. All of these things combine to make her a uniquely effective threat on the feet. So why did Beth Correa decide to try and taunt that good of a striker? Who knows, but she learned her lesson and learned it fast. A big lesson we can all take from Conor McGregor's record-breaking clash with Khabib Nurmagomedov is to not take these Dagestan guys lightly. Conor did absolutely everything in his power to make an enemy of Khabib and his team, crossing every line in the pre-book fight, insulting the man in every possible way. But when the fight started, it was all Nurmagomedov in there. He dealt with Connor on the feet, crushed him in the wrestling department, and then decided to punish Connor's team in the direct aftermath of his win, somehow out McGregoring McGregor with the most dramatic post fight brawl you will ever see. Francis Ngannou has now officially crossed over into one of the biggest combat sports stars on the planet. But when he was initially rushed into a title fight with Stipe Miocic, there was no doubt that he was underprepared. But Dana and the UFC were fully behind him, and in that buildup, Ngannou started to really believe his own hype. He was the most powerful hitter in UFC history, a man destined to become the next Mike Tyson. Unfortunately, Stipe Miocic was just as special, if not more so. And after weathering the early storm, he proceeded to school Ngannou on the MMA skill set for five grueling rounds. Ben Askren had a real air of superiority about him when he made every effort to belittle Jorge Masvidal in the lead-up to their legendary fight. Jorge, who is a man of the streets through and through, had to listen to Askren talk smack for weeks upon weeks before they eventually had the chance to fight. And when that chance came, Jorge, by far, looked to be the more excited of the two. And boy, did he let Askren have it, nailing him with a flying knee in the opening seconds to eventually score the fastest KO in the history of the UFC. Masvidal was confident, but Askren was undeniably cocky, and that just made everything so much worse. Look, when it comes to Chael Sonnen, the trash talk is one thing, but the absolute nerve to throw a spinning back fist at the greatest striker in MMA history? Yeah, we're sorry, Chael, but you 100% deserve to get TKO'd here. One of the all-time great moments of mid-fight stupidity. Conor McGregor might have been a featherweight making his debut two weight classes up, but he had just KO'd Jose Aldo in 13 seconds. Why would he ever be afraid of a fight with Nate Diaz? Well, despite his bravado and certainty during UFC 196 fight week, Diaz, as it turned out, was a horrible stylistic matchup for him. A fighter with a granite chin, a long reach, infinite cardio, defensive boxing skills, and an overwhelming BJJ arsenal. And after eating Connor's best shots, he punished the 145-pound king in the second round with a late resurgence, eventually tapping him out to become one of the biggest stars in the sport. How could we make a list of cocky MMA fighters and not give a mention to Israel Adesanya? A man who has made a reputation as one of the most confident, or in this case, overconfident fighters to ever do it. Tasked with taking out his former kickboxing rival Alex Pereira, Izzy was certain that Poatan's skills could not be as effective in the UFC octagon. And for large portions of their fight, their first in MMA, Stylebender was comfortable. But in the dying moments of round five, Pereira cornered him, unleashing a hellacious series of strikes that eventually left Poatan with the TKO win. A shocking turn of events from this glory legend. Don't make the same mistake as James Vick. Don't try to belittle a fighter as violent and proven as just engaging. Because for Vic, who was once seen as a very good lightweight prospect, his attempts to trash talk Justin just fell flat, almost as flat as he himself fell on fight night once Gagey connected on his chin with a huge shot. Vic had good reason to be confident going in, but let's be real, his downright cockiness cost him dearly here. Alistair Overeem had every reason to be confident when he stormed into the UFC and destroyed Brock Lesnar in his debut. But man, the way he took Antonio Bigfoot Silva lightly in their fight 
was one of the all-time great examples of how not to estimate your opponent's fighting skill. Bigfoot was understandably angry, and on fight night it showed. Once he started landing hard shots on the ream, Alistair began to crumble, and when he finally went down, you could just see how vindicated Bigfoot looked. Joanna Jedrzejczyk was on top of the world before UFC 217, finally on the brink of cracking the mainstream as a star. But when she underestimated and tried to bully thug Rose Namajunas, she set herself up for a career-altering failure. As it turned out, Rose was a lot better than anyone thought possible, and her first round KO of the fiercely cocky Joanna was the first step in a career that would alter the course of the division's history. Talk a lot of crap and try to act like Conor McGregor, and well, you're likely to end up like James Gallagher. After making an enemy of Ricky Bandejas and copying Conor to a T, young Gallagher realized that there's more to walking the walk than just talking a big game. And when Bandejas managed to sweet chin music him in the first round, yeah, that must have hurt. How about this legendary example of why you should never showboat in the octagon unless you're really, really certain that you're safe? This fight was between two amateur level guys, and immediately Joe Harding started dancing and showboating like a prime Michael Venom Page. But he wasn't MVP, not even close, and his opponent caught him napping with a perfect head kick, resulting in a viral moment for the ages. And look! We gotta end with more Beth Correa, because honestly, her decision to try and play the villain against Ronda Rousey was laughable, or at least it was until she brought Rousey's recently deceased father into things. So when Ronda went out there and bulldozed Correa in a minute, the entire MMA community had a good healthy laugh at her misfortune. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Fight Focus. And for today's video, we will be covering the craziest post-fight trash talk slash taunting scene in MMA. Also, if you enjoy this video, please make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and comment what video you want to see next. Let's get to it. What would the fight game be without a little bit of trash talk? Most can agree that it is a vital portion of the sport's popularity. Though it can be cliche, some fighters really know how to make it work in order to sell the fight. In rare cases, had the mics picked up fighters trash talking their opponents right after their bout had occurred. For this video, we've compiled a list of instances where MMA fighters finished the fight and had decided to throw in some trash talk for good measure. Number 11, Cody Garbrandt. Getting under Cody's skin isn't as hard as it looks. While in the clip it's pretty clear that Cody's pretty pissed off, we didn't have any details about what happened until Dillashaw hit the post-fight press conference with the news. No, it was my it was my brother, and uh, he was just backing me, and all he said was, what? You know, and we know Cody's a hothead as well, and so he went after him, and then he had to get escorted, so. And TJ revealed it was his brother who Cody had the altercation with, and that his brother was escorted out by security following the incident. Number 10, R3 Fighters. R3 Fighting Championship, a Russian MMA promotion, actually added a fight to their card after a brawl ensued. <laughs> A post-fight brawl happened and moments later, the men were in the cage fighting in a fully sanctioned bout. The gentleman in the black shirt and the gentleman in the blue shirt entered the cage ready to fight. The two men were seen arguing back and forth. Unfortunately, the men were speaking Russian and were without a translator. Number 9, Cheyenne Vlizmas. Things got a little heated between strawweights Cheyenne Vlizmas and Montserrat Ruiz as soon as their UFC Vegas 22 fight had ended on that Saturday. Bay is obviously frustrated with how that one went. Best part of the fight. The two women began jawing at each other right after the final horn. During the post-fight media scrum, Ruiz gave her side of the story. She first gave a little background on where the rift started, then denied rumors that she actually spat on Baze to initiate the exchange. Everything got started when she insulted my wrestling and my takedowns. She said that I have stupid headlocks and stupid takedowns, Ruiz said through her translator, and she said that she used to know me, so I proved her that she didn't know me at all. Number 8, Mohamed Fakhreddin. There was a lot of bad blood between Mohamed Fakhreddin and Mohamed Said Malem ahead of their rematch that took place at Brave CF 57 in Bahrain on that Friday evening. Over! That is a legend! 
That is not a legend. Brave Nation, that is a legend, legend. That is a champ, champ. That. After the bout concluded, Fakhreddin went over to his opponent's corner and rather than giving respect, he flipped the middle finger at them while celebrating his win. That prompted one of Malem's cornermen to jump over the cage to start an all-out brawl. Referee Aaron Wallace, to his credit, stepped in and prevented the situation from getting too out of hand. Despite doing his best to restrain Fakhreddin, Wallace was not able to stop the Lebanese fighter from breaking free and throwing a punch at his opponent's cornerman. Number 7, Conor McGregor after a thrilling opening round of his trilogy fight, McGregor stumbled back with his left leg folding horribly seconds before the bell. But the scene after was crazy as well. There was no check. There was not one of them I checked. Your wife is in me DMs, hey baby. Hit me back on my chat you later on. We'll be on the line. Dustin secured the win via a doctor's stoppage, taking a 2-1 lead in his series of fights with the Dubliner. McGregor gave his post-fight interview from the mat, insisting he was winning the fight before aiming unsavory barbs at Poirier and his wife Jolie. While Poirier clinched the trilogy fight in Las Vegas, UFC President Dana White strongly suggested there would be a fourth meeting in his post-fight press conference, pretty much saying that the trilogy couldn't go down like that. Number 6, Nick Diaz. Surprised? Back in 2011, mixed martial arts veteran Nick Diaz faced off against Evangelista Cyborg Santos. The top dog in the Strike Force welterweight division. To take and submit after you beat a guy up standing. Evangelista Santos, aka Cyborg Santos, was married to the former UFC featherweight champion Chris Cyborg at the time of the fight. Shortly after defeating her man, Nick Diaz quickly rushed towards Chris Cyborg and decided to talk some more sh the fighter can be seen cursing at the former Invecta FC champion from the cage. You know, just simple Nick things. Number 5, Colby Covington. Everyone already knows Colby is the one to talk, but it got even crazier after his fight with Jorge. So Colby Covington and Jorge Masvidal go the distance. Security immediately enters the octagon. But listen, I'm telling you, if he gets a chance, he'll, he'll take, take a, a swing. swing at him. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there oh, we yeah. go. During their respective appearances at UFC 272 post-fight press conference, the two headliners revealed the trash talk that went on during the fight. Covington revealed he reminded Gamebred who his daddy was inside the T-Mobile arena. Yeah, I was telling him, yeah, I'm, I'm still your daddy. You know, you know who your daddy is. I'm the king of Miami. So take this ass whooping like the little bitch. I'm glad you came out and, you know, took this ass whooping, but... And then Colby would take his mouthpiece out and show it off the game bread. And as the winner of the fight was going to be announced, these both were still talking. Number 4, Michael Bisping. During the headlining fight at UFC 199, Michael Bisping KO'd Luke Rockhold in the first round to win the UFC Middleweight Championship. Afterwards, the two kept with the weekend theme of being overly dramatic outside the octagon, giving us an entertaining exchange during their post-fight presser. The source of the clash of words appeared to have been perceived disrespectful during the original post-fight handshake. Basically, Bisping believed Rockhold was a sore loser after losing his belt despite, by his own admission, being a sore winner about winning it. Number 3, Mayhem Miller. After Jake Shields defeated Dan Henderson to retain his middleweight title, Miller somehow entered the cage and interrupted Shields post-fight interview. Miller had lost the Shields five months earlier and asked the champion what's up, where's my rematch buddy? Chaos ensued as he got jumped by Gilbert Melendez and Nick Diaz, who threw a punch at Miller. Shields was pulled away by his coach, but the rest of his allies laid into Miller including the Diaz bros. Punches, elbows, and kicks were thrown in wild scenes. Miller and Nick Diaz were eventually restrained by members of the commission, referees, and Henderson's team with the brawl broken up. Number 2, Israel Adesanya. Adesanya knocked out Paulo Costa in the main event of UFC 253 to defend the UFC UFC middleweight title. Immediately after the referee stepped in and stopped the fight, Adesanya was cut on camera play humping Costa, and then to top it all off, Stylebender walked over to Costa's corner and coaches and yelled, Strikes and just beautiful. Alright, this fight. While miming an exaggerated ejaculation on them. But this is bulletproof. You can't get through this. So I said something to him, I can't remember, and he said, We're coming for you, and I was like, No, nah, I'm coming on you. Number 1, Habib Nurmagomedov. 
Conor McGregor's teammate Dylan Danis apparently called Habib Nurmagomedov a f***ing Muslim rat during the main event at UFC 229 and that's what set him off. A ringside witness told TMZ Sports, they spoke with a fan who was sitting in spitting distance from Danis during the fight and were told Danis was running his mouth throughout most of the fight. But the final straw was the Muslim insult that Danis hurled toward the end of the fight. Khabib threw his mouthpiece at Dylan and then jumped out of the cage to attack him in the stands. Dylan indeed doubts that he called Khabib a Muslim rat, but since it's Dylan, a lot of people didn't deny it. And that right there concludes this video. Let us know how we did in the comments below. Alright MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, make sure to hit the notification bell, and don't forget to subscribe if you're new. Also, don't forget to comment below what video you want to see next. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Fight Focus. And for today's video, we will be covering the most personal fights ever in the history of the UFC. Fights are fights at the end of the day, but what makes the fights even more enticing is due to the fighters getting a little too personal. We've seen this so many times when it comes to fighting, but even a little bit more in the UFC. Let's get to it. Frank Mir vs Brock Lesnar First up we have Frank Mir vs Brock Lesnar. The first fight between these two began with a takedown the first 10 seconds as Brock was trying to dominate the ground game. The notorious Steve Mazzagatti had stepped in and deducted a point claiming that there were some illegal strikes landing on the back of Mir's head. Eventually these two would stand up and continue fighting until Brock was able to drop Frank on the ground again. At first Frank was going for an armbar so Brock had to move to a stacked guard. But this caused Mir to go for another type of submission. Frank was able to secure a knee bar causing Brock to tap out in the first minute and 30 of the first round. Eventually these two would fight again almost two years later. Brock would be able to avenge himself at UFC 100 when he would put Frank away in the second round due to some very heavy blows till Herb Dean would stop the fight. This led to Brock becoming the undisputed UFC heavyweight champion. This is what Mir had to say when he was with Mark Madden at WXDX in Pennsylvania. Times, I want to fight Lesnar. I hate who he is as a person. I want to break his neck in the ring. I want him to be the first person that dies due to octagon related injuries. That's what's going through my mind. I totally get selling a fight, but this was not the way to do it. Ironically enough, moments before Mir had said these things, he had also said he disliked Brock due to much of the youth looking up to him as a potential role model. Obviously Frank had some sort of jealousy too, so that's something we can't deny. This was after UFC 107 after his fight against Czech Congo. Mir would later go on and apologize after he had received some backlash from Dana White. Frank Mir's a f***ing idiot. I never heard something so unprofessional and idiotic in my life. Later on when Frank would join GCW or Game Changer Wrestling, he would call Brock Lesnar out again and stir more in the pot just like before. Obviously these two had not fought again, but nice try Frank. On to our next one. Next up we have Usman vs Colby Covington. This is one of our more recent fights having to do with the former champ Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington. Everyone already knows of the reputation that Colby Covington has as a person. He has even been roommates with John Jones and Jorge Masvidal. It's surely not a coincidence both of these fighters ended up hating him afterwards. But Colby had received his belt when he was able to beat former interim champion Rafael Dos Anjos via a unanimous decision at UFC 225. Colby wanted to fight Tyron Woodley and I claimed that Tyron had been ducking him in order to lose to Kamar Usman at UFC 235. After Usman had won the fight against Woodley, he had been yelling at Usman saying he sucked and that he was a trash fighter. Obviously there was a lot of talk between these two and would later on turn into more than just a rivalry. They've even had a run in backstage at UFC 223 and would even get into a small feud on Casino Day at UFC 235. It wasn't these altercations that would make it seem more personal, but would be the terrible remarks Colby had for Usman's manager, Glenn Robinson, who passed away due to a heart attack. This is what Colby had to say. You gave Glenn a heart attack for all those years you were, you were ducking me, so don't worry, he'll be watching from hell on December 14th. Whoa, that's a little too far, buddy. Anyways, even Glenn's family had responded with, the death of our father is still very raw. Our family is still grieving from his loss, so imagine the hurt we felt to hear such hateful words recklessly said about our father. We understand the excitement of building up hype before a fight. We are sure Colby Covington can press for his upcoming fight on his own merit and without spewing hateful words towards our father, the founder of the Black Zillions. Later on, Usman would do the world a favor by beating Colby via TKO in the fifth round due to a broken jaw. On to the next one. Anderson Silva vs Chael Sonnen. Everybody already knows the main man Chael Sonnen and the way he talks trash. He was by far one of the best trash talkers along with how much of a humorous atmosphere he could bring with him. Anderson Silva and Chael had already fought before due to the first fight ending with a triangle armbar. This would not be the end of their feud in the UFC. Just before their second fight, Chael was on Mauro Ronaldo's show and had said some interesting things about the former champion's wife. You tell, you tell Anderson Silva I'm coming over, I'm kicking his back door and I'm patting his old lady on the ass and I'm tired of making me a steak medium rare just how I like it. 
This caused Silva to have a large amount of animosity towards Son and making the buildup of the fight even a little more exciting. Che had denied his remarks numerous times before the fight, but you can still find the voice recordings of him saying this on the talk show. Even though Chao had said all these things, this was the feedback from Dana White. Chao saw him motivated, in great shape, injury free, couldn't have been better going, and wanted that title so bad. That first round, you look at the way that happens, and this is what Chao Sonnen said to me after the fight. He said, I have so much respect for this guy, Dana. I've been competing in combat sports since I was seven years old. In that first round, when I was on top of him, I was hitting with those big elbows I felt him break. I broke him in the first round. He came back in the second round and destroyed me. I never seen anybody do that ever. Even though this may be true, it still did not change the outcome of both of these fights. On to the next one. Rose Namajunas vs. Joanna Junjacek. This next one has to do with two of some of the most talented female fighters out there, but it's more about the mental power that matters too. Joanna is known for trying to get into the heads of her opponents before their fights. This all started when Joanna was set to fight Rose. Joanna had told Rose, you're mentally unstable and you are broken already, and I'll break you in the fight. For those who aren't familiar with this, Nama Yunus was a victim of sexual abuse and also had her schizophrenic father leave her family when she was growing up. Rose had responded with the fact that she was an icon for mental health awareness, but this led to Joanna trying to attack again with this. I think you have personal problems, and I'll show you what your problem is. You're never going to be a champion. Rose had also said, I'm not sure if it's maybe a cultural difference or something like that, but for me, it's not something that's taken lightly. My family has been torn apart, my dad died, and he wasn't in my life because he had schizophrenia. It's been something my entire family has been fighting as long as I can remember. So this fight means a lot to me, and it's not just about the belt. Unfortunately for Joanna, Rose would beat her in her title bout at UFC 217, where Rose would drop Joanna in the first two minutes of round one. Even though this was Joanna trying to excite the fight, it definitely was satisfying to watch Rose win and take Joanna's belt. I'm pretty sure DC can agree with me. There is a new strawweight queen! The Hulk Rose with the faith of Hook! The Hulk Rose! And His next one is Jones vs. Cormier. These two have one of the biggest rivalries in all the UFC history. This started when undefeated DC was set to fight John Jones. And, and that's why uh, there's a hatred there. The hatred comes from him. It stemmed from him from the very beginning. Backstage, Brock Lesnar versus Cain Velasquez. And I simply said, dude, I believe I'll take you down. I'll take your ass down, which I've proven to be true. And he chose to use that as this huge insult and, and created a drama and a beef um, right then and there. But DC obviously had his own explanation. I didn't expect John Jones to know who I was as an Olympian. I don't expect John Jones to know any wrestlers. He was the guy that was coming up to be the UFC champion. What I said was, how do you break the ice by insulting someone? That's the only problem I had. It was the first time he and I had ever interacted. He walked up to me, a very tall individual. He looked down on me and started to say some derogatory comments towards me, talking about how he could take me down easy and stuff. So you can clearly tell these guys totally started off on the wrong foot for sure. After this, they would get in a big brawl in August before their fight and would end up paying a fine. Jones had tested positive for steroids and would later on get stripped from everything, from his belt all the way down to his endorsements. DC still wanted to fight John after he had heard the news. Eventually, John would go on and beat DC twice, ending their rivalry. DC always did say that John was fake and that he would go back to being a bad person, and we must all admit he wasn't wrong. John Jones was arrested for DWI in possession of a weapon just a couple months ago. This next one is TJ Dillashaw versus Cody Garbrandt. From friend to foe, these two started out as training partners to title contenders. Back then when Team Alpha Male had athletes such as Chad Mendes and Uriah Faber still fighting, they also had Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw along for the ride. This had all started with Conor McGregor. On Ultimate Fighter 22, it was deemed Team McGregor versus Team Faber. Conor and Uriah had talked briefly before the show about the whole Dwayne situation that was able to blow it up just like it usually does. TJ Dillashaw came on as an assistant coach and was known for being exposed in Episode 6, Snake in the Grass. Pretty much what had happened was Connor had begun to expose TJ in front of Uriah in order to help Uriah realize what was going to happen in the near future. This caused a brawl between Cody Garbrandt and Connor McGregor. Later on, TJ Dillashaw began making his way out to Denver to train with Muscle Farm due to the benefits they were providing for him. When Uriah confronted TJ about it, he began to lie saying he wasn't going to leave, but then admitted that Muscle Farm had begun to pay him monthly and for his house, and so I'm pretty much giving Uriah the thought that TJ had left. After this had made itself to a Brazilian news network, it had caused a lot of drama making it seem that Uriah had kicked TJ off the team. This had made Cody the angriest and will later on leak even more when they were set to face each other with their teams on Ultimate Fighter 25. Eventually, Team Dillashaw would end up winning and would lead on their fight against each other at UFC 217 where TJ would win by a TKO. About a year later, both of these fighters would face each other again, only for Cody to suffer the same fate as UFC 227. Counter right from oh. Oh. Later on, TJ was banned for two years by USADA for having EPO in his system, possibly one of the worst drugs a fighter can have in their body. Do y'all think we'll see a rematch between these two again in redemption for winning while drugged up? Leave it in the comments below. 
Conor vs Khabib. This by far was the craziest personal fights in UFC history, involving altercations between friends and a UFC champion getting arrested. The conflict between Conor and Khabib will be forever put down as the biggest rivalry of all time. Pretty much yet it started when Artem, Conor's training partner, had said trash about Khabib online, and a word had gone to Khabib. Khabib had found Artem and confronted him with several of his men in order to corner Artem to give him his response. The video leaked with the angle of Khabib slapping Artem on the back of his neck and pretty much saying anything along the lines of, never talk bad about me again or I'll come after you. Obviously, hearing Khabib say this to you must be the most terrifying thing out there. Artem had alerted Conor about this and it had him and his crew come for the UFC 223 main event and attack the buses at the Barclays Center. Conor was yelling to get Khabib to come out of the bus, but Khabib stayed on the bus while Conor decided to throw a dolly through the window, causing the glass to cut Michael Chiesa and start a lot of the other fighters. Conor would then get charged with assault and criminal mischief. Since Conor was the main cash cow of the UFC, you would bet Dana had only given him a slap on the wrist. Conor insulted Khabib's father and there's also a tweet with John Kavanaugh, Conor's coach, jabbing at the religion of Islam. Ariel Helwani had stated, Khabib sends a message to the RDA. Let's do it in September, October, or November. Again, summer is out for him due to Ramadan. This caused John to respond with, at Ariel Hawani. Jesus loves knockouts, but Muhammad wasn't a fan of summertime MMA. Choose your religion wisely, young fighters. When I come down to the fight, the tensions were so high you could feel it through the screen. Khabib would later on win by a neck crank, or a Joe Rogan I called it a fulcrum choke. Pretty much meaning Khabib had to use his forearm on Connor's back in order to act as a fulcrum to get Connor to tap. The fight most certainly did not end there. After Connor had lost, Khabib had gotten up and continually yelled at the defeated champ. He then walked to Connor's corner and threw his mouth guard at him in his verbal bout with Dylan Danis, Connor's jiu jitsu coach. Khabib hopped over the fence and flew over on top of Danis till it was broken up 10 seconds later. While Khabib's corner had hopped in to attack Connor, the Nevada Athletic Commission had held both of the fighters' checks for a while. Connor and Khabib had to be escorted out separately in order to stop another big riot. Khabib had shown up to the post fight interview and apologized. First of all, I want to say sorry to Athletic Commission. What about, he talked about, about my religion, he talked about my country, he talked about my father. He come to Brooklyn and he broke bus, he almost killed a couple people. What about this? What about this? He's also posted on Instagram that he would make Connor pay for what had happened on October 6th. Khabib's father, Abdulmanap Nurmagomedov, later on said he had forgiven Connor for all that had happened and invited him to Russia to train in combat sambo. After Khabib's father's unfortunate passing, Conor had tweeted this. The loss of a father, a coach, and a dedicated supporter of the sport. Condolences and rest in peace. There are still rumors of these two fighting against each other, while Khabib had declined many times that he did not want to. Let's see what Dana puts together. Alright MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, make sure to hit the notification bell, and don't forget to subscribe if you're new. Also, don't forget to comment below what video you want to see next. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Fight Focus. And for today's video, we will be covering the biggest sore losers in MMA history. Fighters literally spend all of their energy trying to make their every fight memorable. You must have seen the fighters with their swelled faces, shaking hands and embracing after the fight. Sometimes the opposite happens and emotionalism takes over control. Being beaten to temporary oblivion in front of an audience of thousands entails not just physical pain, but also the kind of ego shattering pain that keeps psychiatrists in business. That being said, most mixed martial artists seem to take their licks in with a startling amount of grace. But there are a few who do not like the feeling of defeat. Let's see who they are, shall we? First up, Yoel Romero. As much as you love the guy, his defeat with Israel Adesanya was one of the funniest endings ever. If you can understand what he said, Yoel Romero said Israel Adesanya is not a champion. The main event at UFC 248 between middleweight champ Israel Adesanya and Yoel Romero was a lackluster affair, with a total of 88 strikes for the entire fight. Yeah, you heard me right. 88 strikes the entire fight, each one waiting for the other to strike first. The whole fight was very inactive and the boos chanted from the audience resonated inside the entire arena. Yo Romero stood in the middle of the octagon covering up for the first two minutes of the fight without hitting any active right on the spot punches. It seemed as if he was playing UFC 2 when his controller had died. And the whole fight passed this way. The judges really had no choice but to award the fight to Israel Adesanya. Yoel Romero was full of excuses after the fight, stating that it was Adesanya that was the one to blame for the inactivity in a very out of character performance. Here's exactly what Yoel said. That's not what the people want to see here. He's running and running and running. That is not big champion. The big champion needs to stay here in the middle, in the fight, like a really champion. Fight, no running. So you want to see running, go to see the Usain Bolt. Even though Adesanya is known for running a lot in the octagon, unfortunately it didn't change the fact that he was still the winner. Next up we have TJ Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw said, I'm about to cry. 
It's hard to pick out just one time that TJ Dillashaw threw a temper tantrum when he lost against someone, especially Chris Holdsworth. But his loss to Henry Cejudo springs to mind after he believed the referee stepped in too early. He was going unbeatable and defending the belt was way was easy for him all that time until this happened. At the end of the fight, when the winner was to be declared, Dillashaw raised his hand before the announcement, but Henry ended up getting his hand raised. Dillashaw totally seemed to be broken after the fight. He said he did a lot out of the struggle during the fight and hit big punches, but he still wasn't declared the winner. In the post-fight interview, he said that despite telling the referee he was alright, the referee stepped in earlier and because of it, he lost. During his talk, he was about to cry. Going back to TJ's career, he was always known for being a hothead and throwing cheap shots. When he was training at Team Alpha Male, he was wrestling with Chris Holdsworth. After Chris had put TJ in a submission, causing TJ to tap, TJ got up and kneed Chris in the back of the head, pretty much ending Chris's career. The whole story of it's also on Joe Rogan's podcast when Uriah Faber and Cody Garban hopped on. Anyways, on to our next one. Colby Covington. Everyone already knows Colby Covington's reputation. Colby Covington told Kamara Usman, you're a loser. Colby Covington before his fight with Kamara Usman seemed to be claiming victory already. Covington was on a seven fight win streak heading into his title fight with Kamara Usman. It was not shy in running his mouth, as usual, leading into the fight. Beating Robbie and Rafael Dos Anjos contributed heavily towards his attitude for sure. He said Kamara Usman was nothing before him. In an interview, he said Kamara Usman was wearing his mother's dress on the stage, but the fight proved really opposite. The punches delivered by Kamaru Usman landed on one after the other on Covington's face. And in the end, the knockout punch left Covington on the ground. He lost the very close fight by TKO in the last round and proceeded to immediately run out of the arena after the fight. Obviously after when Kamaru Usman had been proclaimed the winner. He also blamed the referee for what he thought was an early stoppage, not knowing that his jaw had been broken. But the whole world knew what had really happened and who was to be blamed. Next up, Kevin Lee. I'm pretty sure you guys aren't surprised that Kevin Lee's on this list. Everyone already knows of Kevin Lee or Motown Phenom as one of the poutiest fighters, especially when it comes down to the UFC. It was more well known when he was able to land a fight against Tony Ferguson, or what everybody else knows him as, El Kukui. Kevin is known for being a smooth talker and trying to remain chill, even in the most tense situations, but his trash talk would not get to the best of Tony. After these two had fought and Tony had beaten Kevin by submission, Kevin Lee's little temper tantrum was just too hard to miss. I mean, come on. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this contest. At four minutes, two seconds of round. I'm pretty sure the MMA community enjoyed seeing this, since Tony's one of the most favorite fighters to this day. And the fact that a newcomer like Kevin Lee was talking that trash definitely didn't settle right with the community. Another scenario was when he had fought Al Iaquinta and thought that he was going to get his hand raised, till Iaquinta's was raised instead. The look of awe on Kevin's face was priceless, while everyone believed that Al was the rightful winner was all too good to watch as well. The props he had to give him was this time. He didn't put much complaints into it and was able to try his best to let it go, even when he was interviewed after the fight. I thought I had the first three rounds for sure. Next up, Tiki vs Lawler. Tiki called Lawler overrated. The young and the undefeated Lawler at the time took on the kickboxing specialist Tiki. Tiki succeeded in landing some decent kicks before he got knocked out cold in less than two minutes of the fight. Tiki got a bad bleeding cut over his left eye that was convincing for the crowd that Lawler was actually not overrated after this occasion, but underrated. Right. Here's the interview. A little overrated, would you, uh, would you take that back right about now? Would I take it back? No, I got a cut. Well, they stopped because of a cut. Uh -oh. Quite the opposite, Lawler is known for having a really level head and has caused admiration for many fans. I mean, how can you hate this guy? Especially after his loss to Ben Askren, was probably one of the most classiest moments in MMA history. Next up, we have Nick Diaz. Even though the Diaz brothers are the most loved siblings in MMA, doesn't mean they don't have their fair share of not accepting defeat. Nick Diaz has never taken to losing well. He's always had excuses ready to be delivered when he is called into question for his loss. Seemingly after every loss Nick has ever had, he immediately retires from the sport. Unlike most fighters who suffer losses, the former Strikeforce welterweight champion doesn't take a few days off in order to gain some perspective. No, he tends to abandon his chosen career immediately and without a moment's hesitation. This happened after his two most recent losses to GSP and Carlos Condit, or Conduit. But in fairness, people will tend to not take the Stockton native too seriously when he quote unquote retires. He crammed about four different excuses into the one interview when reviewing his fight against GSP. He said he didn't sleep more than four hours normally. But before that fight, he slept 14 hours and he was given some type of dopamine. Everyone knew what he was talking about. But you can't sit there and say it's not entertaining. That's what we all love the Diaz brothers. Regardless, no disrespect to Nick and his overall talents as a fighter. Next up, we have Jamie Varner. Jamie Varner has had an up and down relationship with MMA fans over the years. 
He's a strange cat and is the former WEC lightweight king. Sometimes Varner comes across as one of the most likable individuals in the sport, and other times it makes Brock Lesnar look genial. He was arguably at his most antagonistic point after 2010 loss to Benson Henderson via guillotine choke. Rather than taking it on the chin, Varner immediately got on the microphone and defiantly declared, I came to fight, he came to grapple. This would have been bad enough if it were true. But watching a replay of the fight reveals that Varner initiated the majority of the grappling exchanges, including a takedown attempt that led to the fight ending guillotine. Next up, we have Michael Chiesa. Up until UFC on Fox 8, Michael Chiesa has never tasted defeat in mixed martial arts competitions. In interviews, he always came across an affable, fairly easygoing character. He seemed to be the type who would lose as gracefully as he wins. Imagine everyone surprised when the former Ultimate Fighter winner sprinted out of the cage moments after tapping out to Jorge Masvidal's submission. He ran from the arena real quick. Whether it was a homage to Forrest Griffin, or he had simply had dinner reservations, it was a pretty bizarre scene. He neither embraced his opponent nor shook his hand. In all fairness, Chiesa took to Twitter the next day and apologized for being a poor sport. So I guess you could call it some redemption. Next on our list, we have Razi Jabari. You might not have heard of Iranian mixed martial artist Razi Jabari unless you pay attention to some of the most bizarre MMA stories that pop up from time to time. At URCC Baguio 3, The Invasion in 2011, Jabari had been mounted and beaten by Honorio Benario. The bout lasted all of 90 seconds, and to those in attendance, there didn't appear to be anything remotely controversial about the bout's ending. Of course, a mixed martial artist scorn doesn't necessarily need to have a legitimate gripe in order to cause mayhem. He confronted the referee after the decision was read out and the pair engaged in an impromptu MMA bout, battling with each other against the ring rope. Clearly not satisfied that this scene was sufficiently comical, the URCC promoter Alvin Aguilar hopped into the ring and sunk in a rear naked choke on Jabari, diffusing the situation and giving the gobsmacked crowd something to tell their grandchildren about. Needless to say, Razi Jabari hasn't fought since. Coming to the last on our list, we have Yoana Yunjacek. Coming to the last on our list, we have Yoana Yunjacek. Yoana Yunjacek said this about Rose Nama Yunus. What a fake champion. One of the most dominant champions of the modern era, Joanna Yunjacek, has five successful titles before being finished shockingly by Rose Nama Yunus at UFC 217. The former champion initially made no excuses and actually congratulated her on her victory on that night. But later, she kept making excuses and comments denying her loss. She said that she would prove her victory in UFC 223, but once again, Rose Nama Yunus proved to be the winner again, retaining her title by unanimous decision. After that, Yuana Yunjechik continued to call Rose Nama Yunus a fake champion and didn't think that Rose Nama Yunus deserved to be the UFC's women's strawweight champion. Even after two defeats against Rose, she kept saying that Rose is not on her level. Rose showing her classy self did not make any responses to this. That's why she's one of the most favorite female fighters right now. Alright MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, make sure to hit the notification bell, and don't forget to subscribe if you're new. Also, don't forget to comment below what video you want to see next.